and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. This morning, I want to continue our reading and discussion of John Dowling's book, The History of Romanism. We'll begin on subsection 46 on page 286 for those who are following around, sub, uh, uh, following along, rather. Subsection 46 page 286, give you some time to find your place there before we begin, but this morning, before I begin, I'm going to have a somewhat humorous uh, interlude this morning, and many of you who are regular listeners will recall that uh, we were reading subsection 45 yesterday, where it is recorded how Pope Innocent flattered King John of England just before the Pope, Innocent, declared himself the King of England, despite King John's face. And I took that reading, and I made my usual comment, how I warned my listeners against flatterers. Okay, I used the example of Pope Innocent and his flattery of King John. Remember, he sent him four golden rings with precious stones in them just before he he basically unseated King uh, King, uh, John. Look, I described my reaction to flatterers as first drawing both six guns and cocking both hammers. Okay? I use that as an example to show how my listeners should respond to flatterers. Now, one of my listeners, a precious French listener, and that's as far as I'll go, I'm going to preserve his identity, took my reading and discussion of that incident uh, and was fearful that It was a warning from me to him not to send me flattering emails. The the poor blessed soul had a day or two before sent me a very complimentary email praising me and Inquisition Update and the lessons he'd learned and all. And he took that coincidental reading of subsection 45 in this book as a an indirect warning to him never to flatter me. <laughs> now, you might find this comical, and you might find this relief, because you may be one of those who have sent me in the past a complimentary email. There's a difference between a compliment and a flatter. And I gave the example of how Satan, the most subtle of all the... Uh, all the uh, the beasts in the Garden of Eden use flattery against Adam and Eve. Remember, we are supposed to know the wily schemes of the devil. Okay? The very first lesson in Scripture about the devil is he uses flattery to gain the upper hand and to gain control of his subject. In this case, it was Adam and Eve. God had warned them not to eat of the tree of the, free in the, of the, tree in the center of the, of the garden, the tree of good and evil. And Satan said, well, you can eat of it, for God doth know that the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be opened and you'll be as gods, knowing both good and evil. Now, isn't that a flattery? 
you'll be as gods, knowing both good and evil. And they ate. Eve ate, and she gave to Adam, and he ate, and now we're off to the races. The whole creation has suffered since that day. And Satan has had control. Okay? You see what damage can result if we are not wise of the methods of Satan himself? And take the instance of, of, of Jesus' temptation. Oh, by the way, flattery is temptation. Okay? Jesus was flattered by Lucifer, right? By Satan. He said, look at all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them all. To them, to you, I will give them if you will just bow down and worship me. Now, if the second Adam was as easily flattered as the first Adam, he might have taken the bait. The trouble was, the second Adam was not fallible. He couldn't be flattered. The Bible plainly says, the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. Jesus knew he would be the inheritor of all this earth. And Satan, though he may be the God of this world and can give to whom he pleases the kingdoms of this world, Jesus knows it will all be his by the, by, when it's all over. And so the second Adam didn't fall for the flattery of the serpent. Now, let me tell you how I have experienced flattery here on First Amendment Radio. And you can compare, my dear French listener, your complimentary email with the flatteries that I have received in the past here at Inquisition Update. And see if there's any comparison whatsoever. I once had a listener who was extremely flattering. As a matter of fact, he promised, and this might be news to Nicholas at First Amendment Radio, because I've never discussed it with him. He was going to make me a star. He was going to buy me a big computer. He was going to develop an elaborate and beautiful website for me. And he was going to take me off First Amendment Radio, where there are very few listeners, and put me on a mega giant network where I would have incalculable number of listeners, incalculable number of listeners. As a matter of fact, he was going to make me compete, if not demolish Alex Jones. Okay? I was going to make a big salary when the, when the success finally hit, and I was going to be a star. Now, most people would have been flattered. You know what I did? I laughed the man to scorn. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Do you listen to Inquisition Update? Well, of course, I'm your best listener. I'm this and I'm that. And I told him, listen, Inquisition Update and the subject of Inquisition Update, will never be popular. It is for God's people, an extreme minority in this world. As a matter of fact, most Christians, both Catholic and Protestant, will despise Inquisition Update. The Catholics, because I out their Pope as the Antichrist of the Bible, the Antichrist of history, the Antichrist of Scripture and prophecy, but Inquisition Update spends the majority of its time talking about the apostasy that is now regarded as Protestantism in this country, where they all believe in a future Antichrist. They no longer believe the Pope is the Antichrist, therefore they're not Protestant at all. And I told that man I could count my true friends on one hand. You're never going to make me popular. The truth is never going to be popular. And you're a charlatan. Now, listen. 
my listeners have to know that if this man was going to make me what he said he was going to make me and make me a competitor to Alex Jones, guess what I'd be talking about? I'd be talking about the New World Order. I'd be talking about chemtrails. I'd be talking about space aliens. I'd be talking about harp. I'd be talking about anything and everything except the Bible, just like Alex Jones does. And how satisfying do you think that would be for me? To be spoon-fed what I should talk about on Inquisition Update. Now, were I selfish? Were I foolish? Seeking worldly gain? I might have taken the man up on his offer, but that's not how I am. I want to preach the truth. And here's something else. The truth that I, sp- that I speak about here on the Inquisition Update, I came to it kicking and screaming. I resisted it until I could no longer deny it anymore. I was a futurist all of my life. I was taught it from cradle to grave. There was nothing else to compete with it. That's all I ever heard in all the churches that I'd been to all my life. It was futurism, a future Antichrist, a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th and final week. Daniel chapter 9. But until God opened my eyes one time, alone, at work, where there were no pastors, no priesters, to rehearse the futurist lie, I simply read Daniel's prophecy exactly the way it was written. And I understood that Daniel wasn't prophesying a future Antichrist to come and sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews. He was talking about Jesus Christ who made a covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. And I'm thinking to myself, how did Jesus cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease? And instantly, the passage of Scripture came to me, to my mind, that when Jesus gave up the ghost, said it's finished, and gave up the ghost, instantly the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. Now, I'd studied enough in the Old Testament to know that that veil had to be intact and it had to be in place because no one could look into the Holy of Holies, much less go in there, But the high priest, once a year, and not without blood, he had to have a blood sacrifice in his hands. He had to have first made a sacrifice for himself, and then one for all the people, and he had to take that blood in past that veil into the Holy of Holies. And if he wasn't fully consecrated before he went in there, he was slain. And now with that veil ripped in twain from top to bottom, that Holy of Holies was wide open. Now, that made the temple a death trap. No one could go in there. Unless, of course, they understood that Jesus was the Lamb of God and that full, complete, permanent, eternal propitiation had been made for sin. And at that point, there's no more sacrifice for sin. There's no more oblation. There's no more Temple Mount worship. There's no more priesthood. Jesus replaced it all. Now, do you realize how contradictory that is to everything that I'd been taught all my life? At first, I couldn't even understand what I realized. It took two decades for me to finally comprehend fully what God revealed to me that day. And I'm still learning. And from that, you can only conclude that it was a gift, an unmerited gift from God. It was a miracle. If there's ever been a miracle in my life, 
It was that night alone at work with the Scriptures and with the Holy Spirit. That's how I was brought to a true understanding of the Scriptures. And that's when I began my war against futurism. And it's not my war. Remember, I was a futurist all my life. I had no reason to entertain any other interpretation of Bible prophecy. I thought it was correct. It was the only one I'd ever heard. It's the only one I knew that existed. Until God opened my eyes that night. And He's been opening my eyes more and more for the last two, two decades. So I have nothing about which to boast. I have nothing but humility. And therefore, I can boldly proclaim what I proclaim here every day on Inquisition Update without shame, without fear, because I know it's true. And I know it was given to me by God himself, despite my previous t t uh, learning and despite my own will. Now, knowing the miraculous thing that God did in my life bringing this about, I'll tell you about another flatterer in, in my life that you can take a, an object lesson from. He was a flatterer, complimented me all the time, and he was at the same time sending me books to read on Inquisition Update. And I read those books. I read those books through my own eyes, and I kept reading the books that the man sent me. And I could see that the content of Inquisition Update was changing. I wasn't talking about the things that I felt led of the Lord to talk about. You know what I finally came to realize? The man was a futurist. He didn't agree with my historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy, and he didn't want me to talk about historicism anymore. He wanted me to talk about futurism. Or, if I wouldn't agree to talk about futurism, I would talk about anything and everything but that subject. Now, you might have already concluded that historicism and futurism are the principal discussions on, on uh, Inquisition Update, and they were given to me by God to speak about. And if I were to cease doing what God put me here to do, God would replace me with somebody who would obey him. Well, I have since, I have since separated myself from him, and I return to the business of Inquisition Update, which is the business of God, to expose the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden, futurism, and to restore true Protestant understanding, true Protestant faith. Now these flatterers, both of them that I've described to you, the one that was going to make me famous, and the other one who was going to have me read only the books that he was sending me to read, they were both futurists. They were both futurists. You see, flattery always has a purpose. To control you. To change you. To make you what they want you to be. Now, in answer to my dear French listener, did you try to change me? Did you try to change the content of Inquisition Update? No. And your praise and your compliments are taken by me in the spirit of which they were intended. And I'll tell you this. I don't get many complimentary emails. And each and every one is precious to me. It's the only real payment that I get for doing Inquisition Update. I live for it. It's what gets me out of bed every morning to come and do this program. Let me just tell all of my listeners, now that you know how I came about this subject, how miraculous it was and against everything that I'd ever been taught and even against my own will, 
your compliments and your praises belong to Jesus, not me. Not me. And that's who I want you to praise and compliment. Inquisition update is only an instrument through which Jesus intends in the hearts of those who will receive it the historicist and the Protestant truth. It's a gift. Receive it. In the spirit it was intended. A merciful gift. I'm just the, I'm just the gift bearer. And I claim no credit. No credit. Because I resisted Christ at every turn until he finally conquered me. And I'm just as thankful as you are. Let's enjoy this gift together. Now, with that, I hope I have eased the mind of my dear French listener and all my listeners. Feel free to compliment Inquisition Update. It won't be regarded as a flatter unless you try to use it to control me and to change me and to change the content of Inquisition Update or have some other selfish motive. I hope this puts that issue to bed once and for all. I thank all my listeners for taking the time to listen and for taking the time to write. And now I'll get back to the business at hand. Inquisition Update, subsection 46... Page 286, we've just concluded our reading of how the Pope flattered King John and then tried to control him. And not only that, but to take over his kingdom. What should John have done with these flatteries? Send them back to the Pope unopened. If King John was going to be king of England, he was not going to pay any heed whatsoever to the Pope. But he did pay heed to the Pope by accepting the gift from the Pope. And now the Pope is going to control him. So the Pope elects, against the king's will, his own pick for the Archbishop of Canterbury. The papacy is going to maintain control of the shadow government of England through the Archbishop of Canterbury, Langdon. The king wanted someone else. So now let's continue with subsection 46. There was an angry series of letters exchanged between King John and the Pope. And it says these letters might be regarded in the light of a formal declaration of war between the Pope and the King of England. But the contest was very unequal. The former, that is the Pope, had now attained that extravagant height of power which made the greatest monarchs tremble upon their thrones. Okay? The Pope had already established itself as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And this whole book that we've read up to this point proves step by step how the papacy exalted itself from a mere bishop among bishops to the prince of bishops, the bishop of bishops, and now the king of kings. Step by step over the centuries for the first millennium, establishing himself year by year, decade by decade, century by century, millennium by millennium, as both king of kings and lord of lords. This is the period of time when it's evident to all the world who the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy is. Now you know, and it's my privilege to share it with you. It's my gift. It's the Lord's gift. We'll enjoy it together right after the break.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs... We ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe, so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back to the second half hour of Inquisition Update, a program that has chosen poverty and persecution over fame and glory. My name's Tom Fresh, your host, and we'll continue our reading and discussion of this book, this fabulous, glorious Protestant work entitled The History of Romanism by John Dowling. If you would like to support this program and keep it on the air, please support First Amendment Radio. He pays the bills, so... Support First Amendment Radio and pray for me, will you? Now, the Pope had now attained that extravagant height of power which made the greatest monarchs tremble upon their thrones. And the latter, King John of England, had sunk very low in both his reputation and authority, having before this time lost his foreign dominions by his indolence, and I add yesterday by By the help of the Vatican, he lost his dominions. And the esteem and affection of the subjects at home by his follies and his crimes. Okay? Who blackmailed John (laughs) with his follies and his crimes? The Pope. The papacy destroyed his dominions, took away his dominions, and took away his popularity among the people by advertising his crimes and his follies. That's what you get when you confess your sins to a sin-sick priest. You get blackmailed. Okay, and That's how they control all the governments of the world. That's how they control the government of the United States of America. Whenever they decide to wage a war of power with the Vatican, the Vatican and his priests just simply let loose the damning information. That's what you get when you confess your sins to another man. Now, the Bible says we are to confess our faults one to another. Remember, that was written during the first centuries when there were true Bible-believing Christians. 
who held the same confidence that Christ holds. We confess our sins to the Father. And He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, not blackmail us to gain compliance. That's Satan's system. God's system is to cast our sins away from us as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered no more. Okay? Never to be remembered again. But what about confessing your sins to man today? I wouldn't confess my sins to flesh and blood, not on your life. Now, I might admit that I have a physical problem, a health issue, but that's as far as it goes. Your sins are only safe these days with the only one who is prepared to receive your confession and the only one who can absolve you from that sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's the pristine ears of our own Savior. He's the only one in this day in our, in our age who can be trusted with that information. Flesh and blood will deceive you and destroy you and blackmail you. I don't recommend any longer that men confess their sins to other men. Now, you might say that I've gone against the Scripture. If you can find a truly Bible-believing, blood-washed Christian who admits that he too is a sinner and is dependent upon the unmerited favor and grace of Almighty God for forgiveness of his sins, he might be worthy to hear your confession. But if temptation ever comes, the opportunity to sell you out to someone else for a favor, he might crumble under that pressure. Your, your confessions are only safe in Christ. He's the only one that can do anything about your sins anyway. So what good is it to confess your sins to sinful men? All right? You can share your problems with your friends, but don't confess your sins to a friend. Don't lay that burden upon him. He can't help you with your problem. All he can do is pray for you. And that's why I ask my listeners to pray for me. God alone knows what's best for me. God alone knows my sin. God alone can forgive me of that sin. And God alone can help me with my other problems, physical problems. And only Him, only Him do I trust in this our generation. All right. So now, he continues, he says, Indeed, the Pope was not ignorant of the advantage he possessed in this contest. And consequently, without delay, he laid all the dominions of King John under interdict. Okay? We discussed yesterday what that is. The Pope literally inserts the key into the, the, the lock in heaven and turns it and locks heaven up so that no one can go in. Okay? The Pope claims the power over heaven and over earth and over the underworld. That's Roman Catholic canon law. And when the Pope issues an interdict and closes all the churches, if you're in a Roman Catholic country, that means heaven is locked up. You can't go into the church to confess your sins. To a priest, you cannot receive absolution from the priest. You cannot go into the church and worship the wafer God. You cannot take the Eucharist in Mass. You cannot participate in the Mass. You can't get married. You can't have your babies baptized. You can't have a quote-unquote Christian burial. You cannot be buried in consecrated Roman Catholic cemeteries. Your body is simply thrown into the, the streets. Okay, that's what happens under an interdict. 
And this author will confirm all that I've just said. The Pope, in response to the insolence of King John, was to impose upon the whole nation an interdict. And this sentence was published in England at the Pope's command on March 23, 1208 A.D. by the bishops of London, Ely, and Worcester, though the king endeavored to deter them from it by the most dreadful threats. Why did the king threaten these people from publishing this interdict over the whole nation? Because King John knew this was the power that the Pope could wield over any king in any nation, in any generation, to gain the support of the people. The superstitious people who believe that confessing their sins to a priest is the only way to have their sins forgiven. The person who believes that they cannot have obtained grace from heaven unless they eat the Jesus cookie. Those who believe that they cannot gain intercession from heaven without prayer to the saints and statues and images and idols. Those who believe they cannot obtain absolution from their sins but by the priests who serve the Pope, those who cannot get married unless they're married by a Roman Catholic priest, those who cannot have their babies baptized if the church is closed, those who cannot have a, a, a Christian burial if the church is closed, literally know that their salvation depends on opening those church doors, and no matter what it takes, they're going to do. And if the Pope says King John is excommunicated, and if you want this interdict raised, you're going to have to support the Pope in his effort to remove King John from his throne. And this happened over and over and over throughout Roman Catholic history. When a king decided that he was no longer going to serve the Antichrist, the Pope would impose an interdict. And it was because of the idolatry and superstition of the people that it had any effect. You see, the king fears the people. So does the Pope. And the Pope simply uses a, an instrument that is guaranteed to purchase the loyalties of the people against the king by imposing an interdict. And it has worked over and over and over again. Anytime the Pope wants to unseat a king, all he has to do is threaten to impose an interdict in the country. And if his bishops in that country publish that interdict, then all the people are put under pressure, spiritual pressure, eternal pressure to help the Pope overthrow the king. When the Pope absolves the whole nation of their oath of allegiance to the king and the country, they are desperate to unseat the king. Now, I have to ask the question, has an interdict ever been placed in the United States of America? No. Not necessary. That's because our kings and congressmen kowtow to the man of sin, son of perdition. And not only that, but their sins are so many and so disgusting that if the Pope ever decided to blackmail our entire government, he could do it with a word. They are locked up as his servants, morning, noon, and night, 24-7, 365, and they tremble in their boots every day when they go to work. And they author, and they propose and they pass legislation commensurate with Roman Catholic canon law, which is against God's holy, eternal, and immutable law. That is their business. And if they ever depart from their business, their papal business, 
all the dirty laundry gets published. This is a nation of blackmail. Its entire government is locked up by threats of blackmail. No interdict is necessary. And that's why you'll never get righteousness out of Washington, D.C. You'll never get righteousness out of your own state government. You'll never get righteousness out of your own county government. And you'll never get righteousness out of your own municipal government. And you'll never get righteousness from the churches and the pastors. That's the power that is wielded by the papacy. You don't do what you're told. Your dirty little secrets are outed. This is an entire nation held hostage by the papacy. You say that's a stretch? Tell it to King John. All right, the consequences of this tragic sentence are thus described by the historian Mr. Hume. He says, quote, the execution, says he, was calculated to strike the senses in the highest degree and to operate with irresistible force on the superstitious minds of the people. The nature was all of a sudden deprived, uh, rather the nation, the entire nation of Great Britain, uh, of England, was all of a sudden deprived of all exterior exercise of its religion. The altars were despoiled of their ornaments. Okay? What does that mean? The altars of the churches were wiped clean. No more golden utensils from which to prepare the mass. No more monstrances to hold the Jesus cookie. No more pure white linen. No more nothing. No candles, no censers, no nothing. Okay? Okay? It says, the altars were despoiled of their ornaments, the crosses, the relics, the images, the statues of the saints were laid on the ground, and as if the air itself were profaned and might pollute them by its contact, the priest carefully covered them up, even from their own approach and veneration. So have you ever been to a Roman Catholic church? You've seen all the statues of the saints in the niches high upon the walls in the churches to which all Roman Catholics pray for intercession. All those images were taken down from their niches. They were put face down on the ground and covered up with linen so that even the air couldn't contaminate them because England was contaminated because its king resisted the power of the Pope. Okay? And it says, the use of bells entirely ceased in all the churches. Now, no more ringing of the bells. Remember we talked earlier about how the, the priests of Rome baptized bells and that they have patrons who adopt the bells as godfather and godmother to these bells, and they lay up endowments for their maintenance and for their polishing and for their repair. They literally name these bells. Okay, It's all part of the ancient pagan Babylonian roots of Roman Catholicism. Nowhere in the Bible does it speak about the ringing of bells. This is not Christianity at all. Okay, Nowhere in the Bible is anything but condemnation laid upon those who make and bow down and worship images and idols. Okay, The use of bells entirely ceased in all the churches. The bells themselves were removed from their steeples and laid on the ground with the other sacred utensils. Mass was celebrated with closed doors, and none but the priests were admitted to that holy institution. Okay, So the priests would gather every time that, that Mass was to be said, but only the priests would enter the church, and they would close the doors behind them, and they would offer Mass to themselves. The people were denied. The superstitious people were denied 
participation in the Mass. And the Mass is the principal sacrifice of the Roman Catholic Church. It is the instrument by which grace is obtained. And if you cannot participate in the Mass, grace is denied you. You have no access to it. And if you sin and you die in that sin, you die in mortal sin, and your soul is damned to hell. So it's absolutely essential for your eternal salvation that you participate in the Mass. And if the Roman Catholic Pope closes the churches through an interdict, you are denied heaven. Hell will be your home. That's the power of the priests and the popes of the Antichrist Church of Rome. And it's only believed by superstitious people. Because if you own a copy of the Scriptures and you read them for, your, for yourselves, you know that none of this is true. You know that grace is a gift. Unmerited. Okay? It's free. No charge. And Jesus obtained it even while his disciples tried to resist him from going to the cross. Free. It's free. Now what happens to superstitions? They all disappear. They're all regarded as lies. And that's what they are. Satan's lies. Now, the laity partook of no religious rite, that is, none of the sacraments, except the communion of the dying, last rites, extreme unction, it's called. That's the only sacrament of the Roman Catholic Church they could, they could uh, participate in. Now, what is last rites? What is, what is uh, extreme unction? That's when a Roman Catholic is determined to be on his deathbed by the doctor, by whomever, and the priests are summoned to read them last rites or extreme unction. And this is the last chance that human being will ever have to buy his way into heaven. And the Roman Catholic priests are right there. They've denied him the Mass. They've denied him all the other sacraments, but not this one. They're not going to deny this one. They're going to give them the sacrament of extreme unction. And that's the last opportunity any Roman Catholic has to finally buy his way out of purgatory, to buy his throne in heaven by making a large donation to the priests. Now do you see why they allow the sacrament of last rites, extreme unction. And it says, the dead were not interred in consecrated ground. In other words, if they died, they were not buried in a Roman Catholic cemetery. They were not buried by a Roman Catholic priest. And it says, they were thrown into ditches or buried in common fields. And their obsequies, their obsequies, there is the, their... their uh, What's the other word for it? We don't use that term anymore. Obsequies, their uh, uh, eulogy, okay? Their eulogy were not attended with prayers or any hallowed ceremony, okay? They unceremoniously died and were buried like dogs or just left for their carcasses to rot in the ditches. That's what happens when the Pope closes the churches, Issues an interdict. This is what happens. An interdict. This is what happens when the king of the country refuses to obey the pope. Again, I ask the question, has there ever been an interdict issued in the United States of America? That's simply because the United States government kowtows to the papacy. All right? Continuing, it says, we're still talking about the interdict Marriage was celebrated in the churchyard. You weren't allowed to go in the, ch in the church. 
and that every action in life might bear the marks of this dreadful situation, the people were prohibited the use of meat. That's right, you couldn't even eat meat. The popes forbade you to eat meat. What does the Bible say? It's a doctrine of demons. Forbidding to marry, abstaining from meats, which God hath given us. Clearly identifying this church as Antichrist. There, there's no reason to doubt that the Roman Catholic papacy is the very seat of Antichrist. It's like the papacy has used its entire career to prove beyond a shadow of doubt that it is that very man of sin, the son of perdition. And yet the world seems oblivious to who the Antichrist is. And for lack of an explanation of who the Antichrist is, they believe he was a figment of the distant past, in, as in the preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy, or that he's a figment, an imaginary figment of the future. And either one of these two abominations is taught in virtually every church in this country. There isn't a church in this country that stands on the ground, that the, the, the very firm and solid ground that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture. Protestantism is bereft in this country. This whole nation is deceived. You see why I don't have to fall to flatterers? This message is never going to be popular most unpopular among Roman Catholics and most unpopular among Protestants today. That's why I can count my friends on one hand with fingers left over. That's why I have no fame, no fortune, nothing but poverty and persecution. I don't flatter anybody. It's a lonely life. It's a treacherous life. And I don't have very many followers and even fewer prospects. And if you find Inquisition Update to be a blessing, you can thank Almighty God. They were even prohibited from eating meat, as in Lent, or times of the highest penitence. Uh, penance. They were debarred from all pleasures and entertainments, and they were forbidden even to salute each other or so much as to shave their beards and give any de decent attention to their apparel. Every circumstance carried symptoms of the deepest distress and of the most immediate apprehension of divine vengeance and indignation. That's the power of the Pope when he decides to go to war against an, an insolent king, a Protestant king. We'll be back next week. Thanks for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org C-R-O-S-S -S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? 
I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.